Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, all the great people that I've introduced you to this week happen to be practicing lifestyle medicine in the UK, as this is UK Health Professionals Week. And today we have a wonderful certified nutritionist who's also certified in lifestyle medicine, and her name is Rohini Bajakel or Bajekal, I'm sorry if I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, but please welcome Rohini to the show. It's very nice to meet you. And I can't wait for our viewers to hear your story because all the stories have been incredible this week about not just gaining health, but actually reversing diseases, chronic diseases of lifestyle. Absolutely. I've been a huge fan of your work for years, Chef AJ. I think I first heard you on the Rich Roll podcast. And thank you for having me on your platform. It's such an honor to be here with the other plant-based health professionals. We are so passionate about bringing lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition to this side of the pond. You have a lot of amazing people over there in the States, but in the UK, we're a smaller country, but bringing together so many different people um, and sharing the message that you can thrive on a whole food plant-based diet and really just gain, regain your health and gain so much from this way of living. Yeah. Well, you really do have a great story about regaining your health. Thank you so much. Yes, I um, I always find it really interesting because I didn't have perhaps the most visible um, before and after journey in that my plant-based journey was something that started at a really young age for me. But I first went vegan and I was, I'm very much someone that believes passionately um, you know, in, in veganism as an ethical philosophy. And I started, I went vegan over 20 years ago first. So I was very young, I was a teenager. And this was a time where you couldn't even get a carton of soy milk in a supermarket. It was a really different time. And so I have gone through that journey of being perhaps a, a vegan that was relying more on convenience foods, on ultra processed foods, and then shifting to a whole food plant-based way of eating that also happens to be vegan, of course. And that's where I really saw the benefits, both in terms of my mental and physical health. There's quite a lot that's spoken about in vegan spaces around the benefits of veganism, or I mean, whole food plant-based nutrition for physical health, but for mental health, that's where I saw the most benefits for me personally, especially in addressing things like my anxiety or fatigue. But you said this happened when you were a teenager. So what inspired you then? Because I also went plant-based as a teenager or vegan. I was well, a late teenager. I was 17, but still. Yes, I was about 12 or 13 and I grew up eating meat, although my mother was grew up as a vegetarian and that was to do with the fact she grew up in India and that was um, how her family lived and my father ate everything. And when we moved to this country, when I was very little, I was a, a, a toddler, my mum said, oh, I want my girls to fit in. And, you know, we just ate what everyone else was eating. My sister, whose favorite food was sausages, came home one day and declared that she was no longer going to eat animals because pigs were cleverer than dogs. And then about a year or two later, she made the connection between dairy and meat and came home and said white equals red. So she was drawing the comparison there between the milk and essentially the meat, how it's all interrelated and becomes part of the same process. And um, my parents were really shocked, as you probably know, a lot of vegetarians and there are a lot of Indian vegetarians, I think, roughly around 40% of the, the country are mostly vegetarian. And um, that is also to do mostly with caste rather than an ethical philosophy, uh, philosophy necessarily. But um, that's kind of normalized. So you could be a vegetarian, but my mum and dad were a bit worried when she said vegan. And she didn't, they didn't, she didn't say vegan, but she didn't want to eat anything from animals. So they weren't quite sure how we were going to thrive. But um, my parents were very supportive. And my mom said, if my daughter's going to do this, I want her to be healthy. So we all at home went totally vegan. And my mom, me and my sister were all vegan completely. So we didn't buy any leather or wool or anything like that. And it was difficult growing up as a teenager in the UK, um, again, being Asian, you know, women of color, it was, it was difficult not to stand out. And when I went to university, I studied at Oxford University. And when I was there, I thought I would be meeting other like-minded people who also would care about animals, but that was not my experience. The very first day of the university was a greyhound race followed by a hog roast, which was horrifying to me. And I, then I really struggled with food. The healthy home-cooked food I had at home 
growing up in an Indian household and dal and vegetables and lots of fresh fruit. I'd always never had a problem really with health until that point I went to university where suddenly I was crippled with daily anxiety, fatigue, polycystic ovarian syndrome symptoms such as chronic cystic acne. I gained weight and I lived on convenience vegan, vegan foods, so chips, lots of alcohol, um, falafel, just anything I could get, white pasta, um, and just, oh, I knew all the accidentally vegan foods, so all the crisps and biscuits that were vegan, but obviously they weren't really serving my health. But at the time, I didn't really know the connection between nutrition and health. So I just did what lots of university students do, which is just, um, you know, survived and bought the foods that were cheapest. And I really didn't eat enough fruit. I actually thought fruit contained too much sugar, which is mortifying now, I know, as a nutritionist. But um, I, I struggled, I really did. And by the end of the university, I was suffering with mental health issues, as well as the physical symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome, which we're definitely gonna go into detail about today. But that the cystic acne plagued me. And I thought it was, I just can't do this. And I actually really slipped off the wagon. Bearing in mind, this is something I find difficult to share in plant-based and vegan spaces, but I started to eat some dairy products and things outside, even though I never felt good about it. And I, it didn't, I think when you eat in a way that isn't aligned with your values, you never feel good and you don't, you feel you're doing something, you know that it's wrong, but I didn't have the support network. I didn't have, I didn't know a single other vegan apart from my mom and my sister. I felt very isolated, alone and struggling. And now in 2021, I can genuinely say with online communities like your platform, Chef AJ, and amazing platforms out there. And there's so many vegan groups, there's so many places where you can make other friends virtually or even in person. We just didn't have this back then. It was a different world. And um, you really stuck out. People thought that vegans, they thought that I would rummage in the bin for food. So they would often say, are you, um, do you eat out of the bin? I said, no, that's a free gun. I just don't want to hurt animals. So I struggled. It was not easy. And so my, my early 20s were a roller coaster of constantly, um, you know, eating perhaps the foods that were not bringing me health or joy. But I had no idea where to start. I had no idea what was healthy. And I'd stopped eating. I, my diet was so different to the diet I grew up with. And my lifestyle also was different. I thought it was cool not to sleep. I thought that, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. I had all these ideas about what you should be doing as a young person. Um, and that's, I'm grateful for that time because it started me on a journey, which I now know that I'll be doing this for the rest of my life. I, nutrition is absolutely my, my passion. And it's something that I wake up excited to do every single day. That is just, that's so wonderful. You know, it, it, so many people eat processed food, whether they're vegan or plant-based or not. And that, that, that just seems to be a problem regardless of whether you're plant-based, the, the amount of processed food people are eating. Absolutely. It was nothing really to do with being vegan. We know that in the UK, I think 66% of the diet is ultra processed food. I think in the USA, it's higher. And it's, it's not processed food, like perhaps, a, you know, a packet of tofu or a can of beans. It's ultra processed foods, which are full of added sugar, salt and oil. They're full of additives, emulsifiers, things that disrupt the gut microbiome. And they essentially don't bring about any health benefits, really. And they just give you that short term dopamine rush which is something perhaps you crave when you're a student and you know you're and you think that you're young enough to get away with things but eventually it does catch up and it really hit me at a time when I was incredibly vulnerable in terms of body image and things and I had cystic acne which was so bad that I often wouldn't leave my house for days or weeks and I felt crippled by anxiety and feeling ugly I felt really unattractive and I think it's sad that in our world we put so much value on beauty standards and of, of course our worth needs to come from within but when you have no guidance and you don't know the foods that are going to give you that joy it's really hard to know where to turn yeah well you know that that's the thing when you wear it on your you, well, I, I mean I kind of this is a spoiler alert but you did I did see a presentation with you before and you know you were wearing the food in a way that that it, I mean, you are obviously very attractive but when your skin broke out that was because of what you were eating it was had nothing to do with your beauty that was related to the food 
Absolutely. And when I changed my diet, I saw such a substantial difference. And I, I'm not saying I don't get the occasional spot now. I am more prone to acne. You always have certain people that are more prone. You do. See, I do see people, you know, I, when I work with patients, you see sometimes people who don't have the best diet and sometimes their skin does still look good. It's not only your diet, it's your lifestyle, it's your genetics, it's everything, but your diet plays a huge role. I would say my acne improved by over 90% from when I changed my diet. So certainly inflammatory foods such as dairy are so contribute so much to acne. And if you have something like polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a metabolic condition, it's a condition which affects how the ovaries function, if you're eating things that are inflammatory, you will see an increase in your symptoms like acne or um, scalp hair loss, which are other things I experience. And there was a study that was done on PCOS, which said that this condition robs you of your femininity. And that's something I completely experience when you're having alopecia, or now it's known as female pattern hair loss, um, or hirsutism, which is excess hair growth, acne, these are all things I suffered from and which are heavily stigmatized. When you're suffering with this, th these are not things that you can even openly discuss sometimes with your partner or your friends because you feel so ashamed. But knowing that nutrition can make such a big difference can give so much hope and, and can empower the person to change their lifestyle and actually address the root cause of these symptoms. Simply putting a plaster over these symptoms isn't going to address the underlying problem. And in my 20s, I was confused about nutrition. I, I did want to learn more, but I thought that eating protein bars and drinking sugary fruit juices, I thought they were healthy. I thought they were okay. And I just saw my acne get worse and worse. I went to see naturopaths, I saw dermatologists, I saw, I spent a fortune on laser hair removal and lots of other treatments, but it didn't ad ad address the root cause. Until I did that, it was just this constant roller coaster where I would manage one symptom and then another would crop up and it became very, very difficult just to to live without thinking about it all the time. So I know so many people struggle with this and I want to give hope to people that you can have, have a way of managing your syndrome in a much, much better way for you and much more sustainable, happy way. Right. And all the conventional doctors that aren't lifestyle medicine doctors that are treating these conditions, I don't think they even ask their patient what they're eating or, or even take diet into consideration. Absolutely. I mean, until the 1980s, we actually diet was being used to address acne quite a lot, but then it fell out of favor. And you'll, you will see a lot of dermatologists now saying oh, nutrition doesn't have a role to play in acne, but that is changing more and more. And I'm glad to say that more doctors are coming on board um, with this, with this approach and that's what we try and do at plant-based health professionals uk as well is try and kind of educate gps family doctors other health professionals about the benefits of whole food plant-based nutrition not just for pcos but for a variety of other conditions and um, and that obviously you talk about that on your channel as well but yes yeah, certainly no one that i saw was drawing that connection for me and so i was left like many other people around the world feeling like I had nowhere to turn. I didn't know what was pseudoscience and what was evidence-based. And that means that you fall prey to lots of um, a lot, lots of myths. I ended up spending a fortune on supplements rather than buying fresh fruits and vegetables. I thought that buying those skin and hair supplements in the pharmacy were actually going to benefit me rather than spending my money on berries and dark leafy green vegetables and things that I now know actually have a much bigger impact. Yeah. So your your family joined you in your journey, didn't they? And you, you're from a family of medical professionals. Absolutely. Yeah. So my sister obviously changed first and my mother, a gynecologist and an expert in women's health for over 35 years. She is very much vegan and whole food plant based. My father only joined us about three and a half years ago when he reversed his type two diabetes. We put his type two diabetes in remission. He lost over 20 kilograms, um, I think 25 kilograms. And my husband is also vegan, my entire husband's family. I, I'm so, so blessed and fortunate that they share the same mission as me and also the same approach. So when we eat, we eat all our delicious Indian food. Indian food is one of the best cuisines in the world, the variety and deliciousness. But often when you go to an Indian restaurant, it will be a lot of deep fried foods, not, not the ones that are gonna bring you health, but actual, Indian cooking, home Indian cooking is so amenable to whole food plant-based 
we have such a variety of ancient grains in India and vegetables and spices, you cannot imagine. So we all do oil-free Indian cooking. My mum and I teach oil-free Indian cooking classes for charity. We um, were really, really passionate about eating all our delicious cultural foods, but in a whole food plant-based way. And I always share this with patients, no matter whether you're Jamaican, um, Kenyan, Chinese, Indian, Vietnamese, wherever you're from, you can eat your cultural foods but you can adapt them to make them whole food plant-based. And I know that you're an incredible chef. I've actually made some of your recipes before and um, you show people that you don't have to sacrifice on flavor if you're going plant-based. And that's so important because I am such a foodie. I love my food, I always have. So when someone says, oh, you must feel so deprived, I feel the opposite. I feel that my life is full of abundance. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of the ethnic cuisines, they're heavily plant based already. So it's just a matter of, you know, teaching people about the oil. And, you know, I know that can be hard at first from removing it, but it, it can be just every bit as flavorful, varied and delicious as if it had animal products. Absolutely. So I actually reconnected with plant based eating and as well. And when I moved to India and in my mid twenties, and that's what changed my lifestyle because it, it was really a lifestyle change. I moved from a binge drinking uh, culture in London of staying up all night to moving to India. And I was working for a healthy juice company. I now don't drink juice because it obviously lacks the fiber that's beneficial. But as you can see, I'd started making a connection already between nutrition and started thinking about things. I was just a bit on the wrong path. And when I moved to India, I started to eat essentially the foods that I'd grown up with. So tons of fresh fruits and vegetables at the market, home cooked food like dal, brown rice, quinoa, but I ate lots of ancient grains that you find in India, like millet and things like that, which I'd never really eaten before. And I felt amazing, Chef AJ. I would wake up in the morning and be full of energy, ready to go. And I couldn't believe it. And I was like, is this how good I can feel? I, um, my skin cleared up. I lost a bit of weight. I I, my PCOS symptoms were all in remission. I just couldn't believe how good I felt. I had more energy than I had 10 years ago. And I just felt absolutely abundant with life. I actually met my husband when I was out in India and fell in love. And I'm sure that all of this contributed to putting me in a much better mental space as well than I had been when I'd been living in the UK and surviving our ultra processed foods. In India, generally people do cook from scratch and whilst convenience food is growing there and there is an absolute burden of chronic lifestyle diseases, you can, you can eat so well. If you just go to, I just ate everything that was local rather than buying imported berries, I would eat the mangoes and the incredible papaya and everything you would get in the, in the local markets. And I was just thriving and it really changed my life and it opened my eyes to the Im impact of nutrition as well as lifestyle when I had more energy I felt like doing things I'd never done before I wasn't exactly a fit and active person I was kind of sedentary by nature I was very studious and I loved to sit and read and when I had all this energy I, I needed to use it so I would go to the gym I would work out I would walk a lot for the first time in my life I actually felt like exercising <laughs> um, and often people say that don't they I, I they often have better quality sleep they feel more like exercising. They, they feel more like they have more, more in them to do the things they love to do. Right. And so that's really what inspired you to become a nutritionist, your journey, right? With your health. Exactly. So I decided to become a nutritionist then, and I knew that I had to come back and learn more about nutrition. So I wanted to get the most science-based course that I could do. I knew that if I did just, you know, um, a specific a course, a, a diploma or something, I might not get the credibility. So I came back and I did my master's in nutrition and food sciences. But in my first couple of weeks, I was told by my tutors, you can't be plant-based. You're not going to, you're going to be deficient in B12 and you're not going to have X, Y, and Z. You need to be eating animal products. So I introduced eggs and oily fish into my diet, thinking that they were good for me and I needed those to thrive. Well, guess what? A few months later, we were all sort of all the nutrition students were sitting around and we were looking at our blood pressure and we were performing finger prick tests to test our blood sugar. And this was a huge wake up call because I took my blood sugar and I expected it to be low and I came out as pre-diabetic. I was not even 27 and it was a huge shock. I was slim on the outside. You know, I had, um, I was very, very slender. I was working out four or five times a week. I was sleeping eight or nine hours. I had 
no stress in my life really I was just sleeping and working and I had a great relationship great family and I was pre-diabetic and I knew my father had type 2 diabetes and I thought oh my gosh I'm going to go the same way and my genes are going to be my destiny and I was terrified and I had my blood test repeated and I still was was type was um, not type 2 was pre-diabetic I came out as heavily insulin resistant my HbA1c was far too high and um, and that's when I realized I need to look more into nutrition. What they're teaching me in the course, clearly it can't be working because I was eating what I thought were whole foods, but they included eggs and oily fish. Now for me, that's N equals one, but that we have the studies there to show that they, these foods can contribute to inflammation and insulin resistance. I know everyone talks about how oily fish is so healthy and all of these things, but for, I think we now know, given the state of the oceans and given everything that we know, that these foods also contain other endocrine disruptors like tylates, plastics, dioxins, and so on. And these ne aren't necessarily the, the things that are great for, for all of us, and um, certainly not in the way that we're living in the world now in 2021. And um, so I switched to a whole food plant-based diet pretty much overnight, and that, that was when you know, since then I haven't looked back. For me, this is absolutely going to be the rest of my life. My father watched forks over knives and put his type two diabetes in remission just um, uh, a, a month or two before I went whole food plant based. And then my family and I have been on that journey ever since. And I took everything I learned with my nutrition degree, some of it with a pinch of salt, because I was told that vegetarians and vegans were anemic. I was, you know, that's what we learned in, in nutrition school. So I had to do my own research outside of it. I obviously did the eCornell plant-based nutrition certificate. And then I went and did my diploma in lifestyle medicine as well. And when I moved to Singapore a year later, I was living in Asia and I saw Singapore actually has the second highest rate of type two diabetes outside of the United States of America. And this is a place where you get so many incredible foods like tofu and greens and incredible things, but it's just all pork fat and ultra processed foods now. And I felt like I need to share what I have learned with other people. And when I came back to the UK, I set up my own nutrition practice I work for the UK, I, I volunteer and work as a teacher for the UK's only plant-based eco-community cookery school to help people who are less privileged understand how to cook um, healthy plant-based dishes. And obviously I work for Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, which is an amazing organization. I'm so, so proud to be there with all these incredible people. We are mostly women, we're very women strong, um, but it's, it, set me on this journey so I don't regret the past sometimes I, I do wish that I had known about whole food plant-based nutrition earlier and I think if I had thrived and I knew that I could eat all this incredible food when I was at university I probably wouldn't have had the issues I had but I also think it's made me a stronger person it's made me a more empathetic health professional and it has enabled me to relate to so many people who struggle to change their diet and lifestyle. For the volunteer job you have as a cookery teacher, are you actually teaching them how to cook? Are you cooking with them, doing demonstrations? How is that working? They cook along with us. So we prepare all the ingredients and we actually show them. And for me, I believe community cooking is such a powerful way to transform the world because when you touch and you taste the ingredients and you see for yourself how incredible they can be, you feel very excited. You feel like I could make this at home and we teach very simple dishes. My mum and I, in our new book, we have over 40 whole food plant-based recipes, all um, with oil-free and gluten-free options for people so all eaters can enjoy them. And we have so many recipes from our family kitchen because we're South Indian where we have a real culture in South India of having a lot of coconut. And that is something that is higher in saturated fat. So we have changed a lot of our traditional dishes to be suitable because we do know that you know, coconut oil, for example, is higher in saturated fat than lard. So it's something that we remove from our diet. So um, that's just something to be aware of if you are plant-based, that there are, you know, I'd say coconut oil and palm oil should definitely be excluded. Um, but yeah, we have all these so many dishes that we love. And I love all cuisines from around the world. So I love Mexican and Thai and um, you know, all, the, all the other wonderful foods out there. So um, yeah, that's, we do show all the participants how to cook and you need very simple ingredients and um, equipment to make the food. So just a chopping board really, and a knife and a, a pot. 
And that's all you need. You don't need to have a Vitamix. Obviously, it's great if you have those gadgets and I love a good kitchen gadget, but you don't need that to be healthy and to thrive. Great, thanks. So you're writing a book or maybe you've written it, but it's coming out next year. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we're, we're putting the final touches on it. It's been a great passion project to work with my mother. It's The book is called Living PCOS Free. And essentially, it's a practical guide to managing the condition using proven lifestyle approaches with West, alongside Western medicine. So it's understanding that, for example, if you break your leg, you might need surgery or you need conventional treatment. But if you have a, a chronic issue such as type 2 diabetes or polycystic ovarian syndrome, you need lifestyle. Lifestyle is the first mode of treatment. And yes, um, you know, that is something that all the national and international guidelines say. So it's not not some hippy dippy thing to say you need lifestyle for PCOS this is what the guidelines say and we are giving people a really practical guide to understand each symptom and how they can manage it and um, the book also contains a 21 day plan by myself to help manage your PCOS symptoms as well as recipes from our whole food plant-based kitchen and lots of information on busting myths such as soya causes problems for reproductive health or understanding um, or things like that. So we bust a lot of myths throughout in every chapter. We have case studies of patients, composite case studies, so everything has been changed, but really to illustrate and paint a picture of the many different people that can have this condition. And I hope lots of people read it who don't even have PCOS because it, the book talks about things that so many people st struggle with, whether it's excess weight gain, insulin resistance, anxiety, um, sleeping issues like sleep apnea. We talk about all of those things. Men and women, people of all genders can enjoy this book. And especially if you have a related condition or something that is a, a chronic condition like type two diabetes, or you have something like endometriosis, this book will be really, really invaluable for you. And if you're, if you're a man and you have a partner who has PCOS, then read the book because you should know about this to support the women in your life. I'm just gonna turn on the light because I can see it's getting a little bit dark um, if the sun was setting in the UK. That's right. It's, it's about eight, eight or nine hours later there. Exactly. And we don't get much daylight in these winter months. Um, yeah, so that's the book. We're really excited. It's our first book together. I, I hope, you know, people enjoy it and support it because I think that the plant-based nutrition space is so brilliant, but sometimes women's health isn't given that much attention. And so we want to shout louder about how plant-based nutrition can help issues like the menopause or um, fibroids or polycystic ovarian syndrome, it is, it's incredible. Um, and we, we know that plant-based nutrition can help with so many of the underlying symptoms of PCOS as well. Are there particular foods that you recommend to your clients with PCOS, either foods to eat or foods to avoid if they have this condition? So that's a great question. And often online, you'll see, don't eat this, don't eat that. We try and tell people, eat whole plant foods. Don't go down this rabbit hole of thinking, getting so specific. There are certain foods that are beneficial and we explore those in the book, but keeping a rule in mind of whole plant foods as much as possible, predominantly whole plant foods. So yes, if you occasionally want to have something else, that's fine, that's up to you. You have to work out what's right for you, but the vast majority of, diet, of your diet should be these whole plant foods. And that includes particularly intact whole grains. So even things like refined whole grains, like whole wheat, um, bread and things like that should be kept really to more of a minimum. We want to be filling our plate with intact whole grains. So I love things like millet, red rice, quinoa, buckwheat, amaranth. I include a lot of these pseudo grains and ancient grains. And I'm a big fan of that. I actually have seen that my symptoms flare up even when I eat processed but um, whole wheat grains, I actually get more symptoms. So that's something we really emphasize and it can be super delicious and affordable and tasty legumes, one of the most important food groups. So peas, beans, lentils, extremely important. I eat beans and lentils three times a day. So you can include them in breakfast. You can have tofu scramble. South India, where we're from, is full of lentils for breakfast. We have lentil dosa, things like that. It's amazing. It tastes delicious. You do not need to have a sweet breakfast. Obviously, porridge is one of the best foods because it's a great vehicle for getting in all those omega-3 rich foods like walnuts and flax seeds. Um, so legumes are really important. I can talk about legumes all day because I'm obsessed with them. That was the biggest thing I changed in my diet when I added back in legumes. 
Indian food is full of legumes, but often people will have a mountain of white rice and a small amount of dal. We flip it. So we have a big amount of the plant protein. And um, that's really key. It's, it do, it's not just protein. It comes with fiber, B vitamins, folic acid. It's so, so key. Um, so you've got the whole grains, you've got the legumes, fruits and vegetables. You do not need to fear fruit, whole fruit in whole fresh fruit. That's what you want to focus on. Sure. If you want a couple of dates, you know, great for naturally sweetening, sweetening foods, but try and go for whole fresh fruit, fruit, because insulin resistance is the main driver of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So you really want to tackle that by eating this fresh fruit with the with the peel on ideally and obviously if you can all afford organic that's cool get that I'd rather people focus on the food so if you can't afford organic don't feel that you need to have animal products because you can't afford organic fruits and vegetables you you're much better off eating the fruits and vegetables and um, you know there are some things like frozen berries that can actually be more nutritious than fresh berries so make it work for you and your lifestyle and then vegetables all vegetables are healthy all of them um, potatoes are brilliant but have them with the peel on because that's where 90 percent of the potassium is it's where the fiber is so and watch how you cook them obviously we don't want to have french fries we want to have boiled new potatoes or things like that sweet potatoes um, butternut squash carrots uh, broccoli lots of cruciferous vegetables all of these are brilliant if i had to say one type of vegetable to really focus on even more is dark leafy greens because they're the most nutrient dense of any food and things like you know kale and broccoli and so on so all vegetables and remember color because the color means that you're getting that array of phytochemicals in that array of antioxidants in so crowd your plate with color and lastly and um, we've got herbs and spices very important for me because i'm all about flavor as a person so getting in the herbs and spices especially anti-inflammatory spices like turmeric and cinnamon and so on are very helpful for PCOS. Cinnamon can help with improving blood glucose regulation and insulin um, as well. So that's really important. Turmeric is in so many Indian foods, so great to include in your diet and ginger as well. And then lastly, nuts and seeds. You do need some amount of nuts and seeds. And um, watch how much you have, particularly if you're someone that struggles with your weight. Um, and, and we do talk about that in the book. We talk about excess weight and we, we give people examples because there are different types of PCOS. And um, if you've got lean PCOS like me, I've never really been someone that struggled with my weight, but I have had all the symptoms of PCOS essentially. And so that means that even with nuts, I still include them, but I would include a smaller amount and I would include them with foods because I find that if I have just a bag of nuts, I could go through the whole bag, you know, and I know lots of other people say the same. So if you struggle with your weight, you don't need to cut out nuts, but you just need to watch the quantity and see how it is. It's much better to have the whole nuts, like the walnuts rather than a nut butter, perhaps. Um, so that's what I would suggest to people is just shifting towards whole foods. So there's a big difference between fats and obviously oils. Oils are, are, are more processed and um, uh, not all of them are linked with poor health outcomes like extra virgin olive oil is one that could be included but I personally don't include it and it's because it's so easy to over consume and it's something you know that I think every, the plant-based world has a lot of division around this what we try and do is just say to people focus on whole plant foods okay so that's the main message and then and we do talk about oil-free cooking. So our recipes do have oil-free options. And there are some people, PCOS gives you a higher risk of certain eating disorders. So we do have to be bear in mind that certain people are vulnerable to being told, cut out everything they get. It's, it's very stressful. And that's the last thing we want. It should not be stressful to follow this lifestyle. It should be about abundance. So really, when you focus on whole plant foods, it does work itself out. You don't have to then micromanage every little thing because that's what your focus is. But unfortunately, um, when you watch cooking channels, you'll see them slosh loads of oil on the pan before they add the onions. You don't need that. You can make delicious food. Trust me. <laughs> and follow Chef AJ because your recipes are amazing and they're oil free. And I love making your recipes. So um, that's what I would say to people. But I know Chef AJ, you've probably seen this as well, division around this topic. It's a heated topic, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, you know, you mentioned lentils for breakfast, and I love the idea of savory breakfast, especially people that struggle with their weight, because too many people start their day with just, you know, sugar, caffeine, refined carbohydrates. So I'm curious, other than lentils for breakfast, what would a day of eating look like for you? 
So in um, yeah, so we give we give loads of meal suggestions in our book, but one of the things that's important is when you've got PCOS, you have to, it is important to have regular meal times. So don't just one day breakfast shouldn't be at seven and the next day at 10. You want to have breakfast. Breakfast is a very important meal for PCOS because we have higher cortisol levels. So cortisol is a stress hormone. So you want to be eating breakfast as relatively quickly after you wake up and you should start basing more of your calories earlier in the day. You want your dinner to be the lightest meal of the day and avoiding snacking. Obviously, the more you snack, the more opportunities there are for overconsumption. So trying to limit to, to you know, two or three meals a day. Ideally, I would say about three meals a day and having a light dinner and um, really having good quality, substantial breakfast will really help. So I recommend, I start my day with a big bowl of porridge oats. I use um, oat groats or steel cut oats sometimes. And then I put cinnamon, which is great for um, reducing blood glucose levels. I add in lots of um, black seed, which is rich in omega-3, can really help with so many different issues, including the fact that it's incredibly high in fiber. The key thing is foods that are high in fiber and low glycemic. Um, that's what's been shown to be most beneficial for PCOS. And again, you're tackling that root cause of the insulin resistance. So I've got the, the, the flax in there and then I add in things like berries or fresh fruit. And that's something I love. In terms of savory breakfast, I love things like a tofu scramble, but I won't just do plain tofu. I'll add in onions, garlic, peas, red peppers, um, fresh basil, coriander, you know, fill, filling your plate with color. That is so, so important. And then there's obviously lots of amazing Indian breakfasts as well so I make them a bit more nutritious if the traditional Indian version is semolina I would add in quinoa for example I just mix it up that way and you can have other savory breakfasts you can have there's no reason why you can't have a curry for breakfast you know you don't have to follow the rules but I find that really helpful and then I eat a real variety. I'm all about the diversity of plants. So if one day you're always having grapefruits, try oranges. If you're always having broccoli, try cabbage, try and mix it up. So my lunch would be something um, really substantial to keep me going. So I love potatoes with the skin on that are boiled and I would have it with like a bean chili. So I love things like a pinto bean chili with mushrooms and jackfruit. And, and I always add greens into my meals. So I will usually have a side salad and my side salad isn't a few things. It's like a big salad. <laughs> and I have rocket leaves. And I think in the US it's called arugula. And I would add in beetroot and radish and lots of different stuff. I just love filling my plate with all the colors of the rainbow. It sounds very cheesy, but it just brings me joy when I see all that color. And um, so if you're not someone that wants to eat lots of raw food, that's fine. You can still thrive. But in the UK, it gets cold, you know, at this time of year, we don't live in a lovely tropical climate. So um, what's important is you can have your stews and your beans and everything, but try to have some kind of salad on the side of that. It's quite a good way to get in all that vitamin C and things. And that's something I find helpful. Um, I do eat a lot of sprouted food. My father makes an amazing sprouted lentil and whole grain porridge for me, and he drops it off every week. I know I'm very spoiled. <laughs> so I love that. And you can do it at home. It does. It, it takes some getting used to when you first start, but it really transforms the nutrient density of your meals. So that can be really helpful. I, I, I always soak my whole grains and beans and things before cooking them. Um, and then my dinner would be something a bit lighter. So I usually have something like a bowl of dal or I'll have a minestrone soup or a big salad with a soup. That's the kind of thing I like to have. And I do have a tendency to snack and that is because of that history of insulin resistance. So I find that making my meals really substantial, including good amounts of plant protein, like the beans and other legumes really fills me up and that actually prevents me from snacking. Um, but if I am going to snack, I would reach for fresh fruit or a handful of nuts. That's the kind of thing I prefer. Um, I don't like snacks that you don't need snacks to come out of a package. We have this idea that snacks need to be something that looks really colorful and comes in a bar that is not what a snack is and really if, if you're constantly snacking you have to ask yourself why am I constantly reaching for foods am I struggling with something is it something else I can do could I call a friend could I meditate could I do some yoga could I read a book could I cuddle my dog it could be anything like that but I know you talk about this a lot there's a lot of emotional aspects of eating as well and I often think 
people don't eat enough at mealtimes. They're eating the wrong kinds of foods. They're eating foods that don't fill them up and that don't have fiber. And when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you should feel full. And I know that everyone who follows a whole food plant-based diet and is listening to this says, it can relate to this, but you eat so much more. Your plate is so full of foods because these are foods that are nutri- you know, calorie light, but very nutrient dense. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's an amazing lifestyle. And so I went on a bit there because I'm just so passionate about food, but that's an idea of what I eat in the day. Yeah. Does that sound similar to a lot of people who are plant-based to you? Right. How will you encourage your clients to make these changes? So I encourage it really, I really treat people as individuals. I try and understand where they're coming from. And we know that, for example, some a lot of my clients who have PCOS have struggled in the past with disordered eating. And so I try and work out why that is, if it how, how they what how that affects them and work on a plan that's going to suit them. But I often say to people, simply start by focusing on what you can bring in. There's so much talk about what you can cut out of your diet. And that is important. Of course it is. But rather than just focusing on cutting things out, crowd them out. Crowd them out by bringing in the whole plant foods. Because when you bring in the whole plant foods, there's less room for that chicken or for that steak or for that donut. Because you're filling your plate with all this color, all these micronutrients. That is something that is is so important to focus on. So trying even one meal at a time. If you're used to having sugary cereals, switch to oats. I try and do that. And there are people who want to go all in. And I love that because some people are ready for that and they want to dive in and make the change. And so I give them all that information. But what I don't do is sugarcoat things. So I won't tell people it's, you know, I don't sugarcoat things. I give them the information. I let them be the guide and let them make up their mind. But what I try and do is give them an idea of the kinds of meals that they can eat and like that they can introduce that are really quick to make that they can batch cook if they're a busy mom of three or they have a really hectic job you don't need to be a gourmet chef you don't need to love cooking to be healthy on a whole food plant-based diet so really focusing on a few things they can bring in is key and then I obviously give them the information about the foods that are less beneficial for PCOS or for other conditions and um, I generally find that people are very receptive to change and bringing in um bringing in more plant-based foods and once they start to feel how good they can feel on this lifestyle it sticks that's what i found is really important so even simple tips like if they're always making pasta i would say to them can you add in a few handfuls of spinach can you bring in some greens can you add in some beans into this meal can you switch the chicken for the tofu and making these simple sustainable swaps makes a big difference um, and I do have some clients who are saying, Rahina, you know, I want to go all in. I want to know how good it can feel. So they dive in and they go plant-based. But it is an educational process because if you just take out the meat, but you don't replace it with the beans, you can end up feeling very hungry, very tired. You need to replace those foods with nutrient-dense plant foods. If you're living on salad leaves and nothing else, you won't be able to sustain this way of eating. Oh, absolutely. Are there any other lifestyle changes other than the diet that you recommend to your clients? Yes, definitely. So I recommend getting plenty of sleep. We know that in lifestyle medicine, the average person needs between seven to nine hours and sleep is super important for people with PCOS. Sleeping issues are really common, like sleep apnea, as well as other sleep issues. So getting restorative sleep is important. So having a good bedtime regime, perhaps you meditate or you have a warm bath. Um, but sleep is really important. It helps control the hunger hormones, ghrelin and leptin. So when your sleep is altered, that's often why you make less wholesome choices and you reach for that candy bar and so on and sleep is one of the most underrated aspects of health I think it does not get enough attention and it's hard sometimes you'll go 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 and that's what the world is telling you but we know that with sleep uh, with PCOS there's a lot of um, dysregulation of things like cortisol and other stress hormones so you need to to manage your health you've got to get your sleep right you've got to get the sleep better and if you really struggle with sleep even just try increasing by half an hour and then an hour and increasing more and more and looking at all those strategies. We, we explore this in so much detail in the book and I know we don't have time today to talk about all those strategies, but um, I would recommend that people look at that because there's a lot of helpful info there. So sleep is really key, movement. I like the word movement because exercise sometimes feels very structured, like you need to go to the gym and pound it on the treadmill and that is not for everyone. I'm certainly someone who really loves 
joyful movement. So hiking with my, you know, walking with my dogs, dancing in my bedroom, doing a YouTube workout at home. Strength training is so important for PCOS because it really helps um, with insulin resistance and um, increasing your lean muscle mass can really help with, with um, reducing insulin resistance. So strength training is especially important for people with PCOS and cardio, but avoid really um, high intensity workouts for longer than 20 minutes. It's actually been shown not to be as great for PCOS, but short bursts are great. Um, so maybe 20 minutes of, of that. You don't need loads of time, but make movement regular. That's what I would say. The best exercise is the one that you can do regularly every day that you can sustain. And everyone is different. You know, you might not like running, but perhaps you like boxing. Like I love boxing, for example. It gets out all that adrenaline and tension for me. And, and other people might love dancing. So find what you enjoy and make it stick. Um, you don't need to do what everyone else is doing. And that's so key for exercise. That's what I would say. Don't exercise too close to bedtime as well as that can cause sleep issues. It's really great if you have the opportunity to exercise with exposure to natural light as that can also help with your sleep. What the beauty of lifestyle medicine is that there are, we, we have this chapter in our book called the domino effect. When one pillar falls, all the others tend to get affected. So often when you get your nutrition right, things like sleep and exercise and things become a lot more easy. And that's what I would say. Definitely avoidance of alcohol and tobacco and drugs. These do not offer any health benefits. Red wine, certainly, you know, it gets so much emphasis on heart health. Unfortunately, so much stuff has been taken out of context. It is a class one carcinogen. And for people with PCOS, certainly we have a very high risk of cardiovascular disease, endometrial cancer, um, and other issues. So we do, don't want to be having these substances in our diet as much as possible. I replaced alcohol with sparkling water with a slice of fresh lemon. And um, you know, these are the things that can really help. You don't have to sacrifice socializing. You don't have to be a monk sitting at home. You can go out and have fun, but you can find ways to do that without, without damaging your health and worsening your condition. And um, so, yeah, that's really important for me. And then stress management, you've got to find a way to manage your stress. It could someone might, one person find, might, might find knitting really boring. The other person might find it really stress relieving. So again, find what works for you as long as it's not damaging your health and contributing to your, to your stress levels. Um, but yeah, finding a way, whether it's journaling, meditating, exercising in nature, having a warm bath, all of these things, all really beneficial. And um, I, I think that there's, there's so much to be said for all of this, but one of the things I find so important is having a community. That's something I lacked and that made me fall off my path when I was in my early 20s, but connect with other plant-based folk if you're new to this lifestyle and um, connect with other people with PCOS. There are great online forums, but most importantly, find your tribe. Find a few people you can confide in that will love you and accept you no matter what. I think that really can help um, when you're when you're trying to change your lifestyle and you can find people who bring out the best in you I had to ditch some people in my life who didn't want to know me when I stopped drinking and partying and I actually op that opened the way for me to find other people who want to share and the things I like to do so going out and planning outdoor activities or planning activities around things that are going to help me and make me feel joyful and um, and that's really important is that sometimes it feels like there's a loss but trust me you're going to gain so much by changing your lifestyle right you know we got so in I got so interested in talking to you I forgot that you did prepare a few slides and I'd like for you to show them because we talked about your acne and that that picture I believe is in the slides absolutely so I'll do a very quick thing this is um with the slides I'll keep them I'll just sorry it's uh gone right to the start let me just play that from the beginning and I'll go through this without going into so much detail, but I do want to mention a little bit about PCOS because so many people actually don't know that much about PCOS and it is a really common endocrine disorder. It affects at least one or two out of 10 people assigned female at birth. So um, this affects women, non-binary folk, trans men, for example, and at least 70% remain undiagnosed, which is horrifying. So, so many people don't even realize they have this condition, although it's the number one cause of ovulatory infertility. So they often find out when they're trying to conceive and it's difficult, but they might also find out um, once they connect the dots. So you think you've got acne, anxiety, irregular periods, but you've not joined the dots. 
Lifestyle management is recommended as the first line of treatment to prevent, manage and treat the condition and its long term effects. So over half of all people with type with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome will develop type 2 diabetes by the time they're 40. That is terrifying over half. So that was me. I mean, I was pretty diabetic at 27. So as you can see, I was heading on that path towards that, despite the fact that on the outside, I didn't look like I had that. So really, it's it's really important to find a lifestyle that's going to reduce your risk of other chronic diseases. So much of the PCOS community is all keto and paleo, but that is not going to reduce your risk of these long term effects like cardiovascular disease and endometrial cancer. Gestational diabetes is also a warning sign for future Future type 2 diabetes and is really common for PCOS. So diagnosing PCOS, this is all pretty technical, but essentially you do need to get a proper diagnosis. So irregular periods, so anovulation and not producing eggs on a regular basis and having clinical symptoms of hyperandrogenism. So again, very stigmatized condition because you get things like excess hair growth, acne, scalp hair loss, um, excess weight gain, especially central um, uh, fat. So it's called visceral fat and you know central obesity. That's very common for PCOS. And then when you have a scan, you can also see uh, a pearl-like formation and of these tiny follicles, and it's called polycystic ovarian morphology. And I know all of this is a mouthful, but essentially you need two out of three of the following criteria. So if you've just got hyperandrogenism symptoms like acne or excess hair growth, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have PCOS. You need to have two out of these three to be diagnosed with the condition. So these are the common symptoms. As I mentioned, you don't need to have all of these symptoms to be diagnosed with PCOS. You may have a combination, you may have none. Some people about, I think 10% have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. And there's obviously variety between different ethnic groups. I'm South Asian, so Asians do, South Asians do tend to have a bit more excess hair, but it needs, you need to get a proper assessment. And um, so these are all these symptoms that you're seeing here, you're probably thinking this sounds awful and I don't want any of these. And it, 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 these are some of the most stigmatized conditions, symptoms that you could have. And people with PCOS spend a fortune trying to manage these symptoms, whether it's laser hair removal or you know special skin treatments and creams or going to see dietitians and going on expensive fad diets. Trust me, I've been there. You've got to tackle the root cause as much as possible. That's going to really help you with the symptom relief. And then there are less well-known symptoms. Most healthcare professionals, many healthcare professionals don't even know these exist, but they're in the literature. We've analyzed thousands of studies for our book, and we found things like eating disorders are especially common with people with PCOS, especially binge eating disorder, which can really contribute to the excess weight gain and inflammation, excessive daytime sleepiness, breathing problems such as sleep apnea, snoring, if you're waking up feeling constantly fatigued, this could be a warning sign, and then darkened skin behind the neck, underarms, or um, the groin area, and psychological symptoms, they aren't talked about enough, like depression and anxiety, these are really crippling, they, they rob you of joy in your life. So to wrap up, the importance of eating plants for PCOS. We've talked so much in this amazing interview about um, you know, the power of plants, but why is it helpful? It reduces inflammation, it improves androgen excess, insulin resistance, and weight loss if it, that's desired. Um, remember that 20% of people with PCOS are not in the excess weight range category, but they can still benefit from a plant-based diet because of the reduction of inflammation. So focusing on fiber, beans, peas, soya. Soya is so beneficial. I include a couple of servings a day. It's rich in all nine essential amino acids, high in protein, um, isoflavones. We have a lot of information on soya in our book. Lentils, vegetables, fruit, intact whole grains, complex starches, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and choose water as your beverage of choice. Avoiding food high in tissue damaging advanced glycation end products or AGEs, so fried foods, beef, pork, chicken, paneer, butter, ghee, ultra processed snacks. So there's Indian snacks like chevda, but it could be um, any kind of ultra processed snacks like crisps and crackers and so on. And 
people with PCOS have more AGE receptors on their ovaries, which is why we're really sensitive to advanced glycation end products. So definitely reduce, reducing the amount in your diet. If you're eating a plant-based diet, you will have lower AGE levels, but it's kept, be careful how you cook the food. So don't eat things like browned toast or grilled food or barbecued food. You often see things like barbecued tofu. You're much better off, you know, um, stir frying your tofu with a bit of water and, and actually not cooking things at really high temperatures like fried foods. You can really reduce your AGE, the AGE content of your diet that way. And avoiding trans fats, sugary foods, sugar sweetened beverages and fruit juices and, um, and, and added oils as well, especially refined cooking oils and consider supplements. Um, I'm all about food first and rather than talking about specific supplements, but vitamin D deficiency has been noted at high levels in people with PCOS. So vitamin D is important. I live in the UK where we don't get much sunlight this time of year. So we do need to be taking our vitamin D. And um, I also have darker skin as a South Asian, why it's especially important. And um, inositol has been shown to improve ovulation rates and, and there's more research happening in this area. So that could be one that's great. It can help with improving insulin sensitivity if you've got insulin resistance. Chromium is another supplement that's good for insulin resistance. And omega-3s, you might consider taking a DHA and EPA supplement, which has been shown to be particularly beneficial for people with PCOS. Um, but most importantly, try and focus on getting foods like flax seeds and chia seeds into your diet. Um, and supplements can be expensive. So uh, of course, if you're on a plant-based diet, you do need your B12 as well. Um, and that's something that's important and it comes really cheaply and affordably. Unless you're eating fortified foods that are fortified with B12 three times a day, I would recommend taking your um, B12 supplement as much as possible. And um, what to eat. So not taking B12 as much as possible, but taking a B12 supplement. It's just the most surefire way that you're going to get it. So what to eat, this is showing how um, I eat. So I eat lots of fresh fruit instead of having palak paneer, which is um, a typical Indian dish, which is spinach with, with a, a cheese, a type of Indian cheese. I use tofu. I eat a lot of chickpeas, red rice. Red rice has six times the antioxidants of brown rice. It's even higher in fiber. I, I love it. And then I made quinoa upma. Upma is a dish that's traditionally made with rubber, which is um, semolina, a processed grain. So I always switch for unprocessed intact whole grains. Um, so I eat a variety of foods and then I focus on color. This is just some of my home cooked food. So if I'm doing a smoothie, I would really focus on greens. I do prefer to chew my food. And if you struggle with weights, then I recommend eating foods rather than having juices or smoothies even. Um, uh, but certainly I find smoothies can be helpful on days when I'm really busy and it can help people with certain things. So people who suffer with nausea or people who are going through pregnancy and suffering with pregnancy nausea and things like that. So green smoothies. And then I love, um, as you can see, I've, I just add loads of different color and I add in things like mung bean sprouts and loads of herbs and spices, but you can go with whatever you like. So yeah, this is just showing my story on the left. That's me at Oxford University, a bottle of white wine in front of me. I was vegan then, but I was not um, not aware of the um, intimate connection between nutrition and, and health. I certainly am smiling, but on the inside, I felt very alone. And I remember that horrible feeling looking back of how lost and alone I felt. It doesn't make me feel happy when I see that. And then in the middle, that's when I have one of my awful PCOS flare ups. I was on the contraceptive pill for over 10 years. And in a way, you know, that's really the only way I was able to get through my 20s. And I have nothing against that, but I think it's important to understand that it's not for everyone. And you need to be able to tackle the root cause of your issues. And for certain people, it has its place. And we talk about that in the book. But every time I tried to come off the pill, this is what would happen to me because I had not addressed the underlying issues relating to my diet and lifestyle. So I would explode with acne and it would be all over my face, pustular cystic acne. That's very typical of what you get in PCOS along the jawline and the chin and it's very angry and I tried everything trust me antibiotics and um, steroid creams every type of 
of prescription skin cream you can imagine I would beg my doctor to give me more and more harsh ones and um, and that this this is what I was left with and um, and so it took several years sometimes even for the scarring to go but on the right as you can see I was I have managed to really overcome a lot of the PCOS symptoms and thrive that's me with my rescue dog at my parents house in the sunshine and um, yes, it's acne is a terrible, terrible disease that is not given enough attention. It's linked to higher rates of anxiety, depression, um, self-harm and so on. And so we need to be addressing it. I think something like 90% of Western teenagers suffer with acne and actually even adults suffer with acne as well in, um, in, due to the foods that we eat. And even after the menopause, um, something like 20% of women with PCOS will still suffer with acne. So it's not something that just goes away after 50. This is something that can plague people throughout their life. Um, and diet can make a huge difference. There is a lot of evidence showing that antioxidant rich foods can really help. So to summarize, nutrition and lifestyle modifications are key for managing PCOS. We want to have aerobic exercise as well as resistance training to improve insulin sensitivity. So aim for 300 minutes per week, ideally in natural light. And um, sleep, ensuring regular sleep routine, really important rather than being a weekend warrior where you have five hours a night and then you catch up at the weekend, that's no good. You want to having having it consistently. Obviously, if you've got a newborn baby or something, it's more difficult, but I'm talking for the vast majority of people, hopefully this is something you can try to prioritize. Stress reduction, identifying stress triggers and trying things like meditation, mindfulness, community work, yoga, lowering those cortisol levels and avoiding risky substances and prioritizing time with your support network. These are all things that really helped me to manage my PCOS. It doesn't mean that I don't occasionally struggle with some of the symptoms. It doesn't just completely vanish. It's, but it means that I'm really on top of it most of the time. I'm now no longer on any medication. I haven't been for the last couple of years and I am thriving on this lifestyle. It, it, sometimes there are times where a stressful life, life events, even like getting married or moving house might trigger me, but it means that I just make an extra effort to stay on top of these pillars. So yeah, that's it. That's my story. And um, thank you so much, Chef AJ, for having me on. I, I hope that people have learned a bit more about this common condition that affects up to one in 10 people and, and, and hopefully, you know, one in 10 women. And hopefully they can share this with their mums, their sisters, their friends, their colleagues, because we need to raise awareness of PCOS for sure. Well, that, that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad you show, showed those slides. And I'm just curious, how can people connect with you? Do they have to live in the UK to get an appointment with you? Do you work in person, virtually through plant-based UK telehealth? Oh, yes, that's an amazing service, which I highly recommend. I'm not, I don't work with plant-based health online. I know you're going to have Laura on soon. And um, that's, I work for Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. We have a great fact sheet on PCOS. We have lots and lots of um, free resources. Every two weeks, I hold a webinar with other health professionals. I've had some of your brilliant guests like Dr. Esselstyn and people like that onto my program and um, they, they're brilliant. And so we've covered different topics every two weeks. I do see clients one-to-one -one virtually around the world. I also have my clinic in central London, but if anyone wants to see me and address all aspects of their lifestyle and nutrition for PCOS specifically, this is a whistle-stop tour of a very complex condition that requires some individual guidance and management that I'd be very happy to work with them. And if they've got any other you know, issues that they want to work with, my main focus is on getting people to transition to a whole food plant-based lifestyle. So I work with a lot of vegans who are vegan but they're not necessarily eating the foods that are benefiting their health as much and um, they're obviously doing something great for the world by being vegan but we want to look after you as well we want to make sure you're thriving and so that's what I do I work with them one-to-one -one. but I, I do have clients in North America Canada and um, even Singapore where I used to live India Australia so I love connecting with people all over and I do the consults virtually so yeah that's the best way I'm really active on Instagram I post every single day at Rohini Bajekal and I also have my website rohinibajekal.com with tons of resources and obviously uh, my book is out in February living PCOS free and hopefully you'll um, support that and, and have a look at that but if, if it's not for you then just come and say hi on Instagram it'd be really nice to hear from you. 
Great. Well, thank you. I'll make sure I put all those links in the, the show notes. And the, the webinar thing sounds great because uh, Dr. Kassam was saying people can can have that. They can People can join that and get those bi-weekly webinars. Exactly. They're completely free. Every two weeks, it's a different topic. So plant-based diets for older adults, plant-based diets for Crohn's, plant-based diets for kidney disease, and they're CPD and CME accredited. So if you're a health professional listening, you can actually get CPD points totally for free, which is amazing. And if you're just someone who's interested and you want to learn more about how plant-based diets can benefit these conditions, we have the best guests, lots of American guests as well. And um, they're, they're, they're so every all that I always learn so so much from that and I I find that the more that you're on this journey and the more that you learn the more you realize how it's all connected there's no one diet for PCOS and one diet for heart disease it's the same way of eating and that is what is beautiful and that you know there are obviously little tweaks that you can make to really to, to benefit certain things but overall the way of eating that benefits PCOS is the one that will protect you from the risks of the long-term um, issues associated with the condition like the heart disease like the endometrial cancer like the gestational diabetes so and um, hopefully that gives people some clarity because there is so much confusion about nutrition and um, I actually think it's quite clear when we look at the science. Great. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing and congratulations on the health that you've achieved. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. Thank you for being such a light and inspiration to so many people around the world and sharing so many, your platform with, um, with everyone and generous, so generously with your time. I'm really excited to try more of your recipes as well. I, um, I love the way that you explain and you're so passionate about food. It's really infectious. Well, thank you. If you like lentils, definitely try my red lentil chili. Oh my gosh, I love red lentils. So I'm definitely going to try that. I will post it on Instagram this That's week. one of my most popular recipes. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. See you soon. Bye. You. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another great lifestyle medical professional from the UK. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.